Our Scottish correspondent Neil Rowantree is in New Zealand hunting Himalayan tar. Plus, how does this grow this? Easy, it just takes 30 years. Closer to home, we're filming partridges landing on Paul Childerley. It's our modern gamekeeper series. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Last time on Planet Deer, we looked at how the Reds of the Scottish Highlands ended up on the other side of the world. In New Zealand, the Reds flourished, reaching pest proportions. But then some entrepreneurial thinking created a market for their meat and for their velvet, the live tissue covering their growing antlers. In this episode, Neil Rowantree is down on the farm with the Fraser family, learning more about managed deer behind fences, their methods, their business, and why a Fraser red deer dwarfs others in body and antler size. He's also outside the fences, hunting not for reds yet, but another mammal that has made New Zealand its adopted home, the Himalayan tar. Let's start big. These are the antlers of the main breeding stag on the family farm. He is an exceptional animal, not just because of his rack, it's because his genes throw big male and female calves. Amos, you've got something quite incredible in your hand there, and uh, this is obviously, you've been knee high to a grasshopper in this, and you've got a passion for them too. Yeah, absolutely. So, this is an example of um, antlers off a one-year-old stag, so off a spiker. So this is the uh, the next generation again starting to starting to come through. Um, I mean, you see the sort of type of animal that we're trying to breed, which is a long head, which still has a real typical brow bay tray, um, but then opens up into these really big, long scoring tops. Uh, most people forget that when you're trying to shift a, a population that half the genetics come from the female base as well as from the males. Because you've got to remember that when we started farming these deer uh, in the 1970s, that really they were no better than the Scottish herds. They were wild, um, had exactly the same antlers. Um, the ability for us to get to where we are today has just been through the uh, intensity of the breeding and the selection that we could make um, through being able to, to record and measure. And just to get that absolutely clear, what you're telling me is there's no boluses, drenches, injections, that's pure feeding and genetics. Yep, there's no hormones, there's no antibiotics. I mean, for us, um, most of the deer that are farmed in New Zealand are actually for their meat, which is exported right around the world. And our license to be able to export our products is determined by our ability to demonstrate that our products are free of all of those different elements. So for us, we're very heavily regulated and we're always measured around ensuring that none of that stuff happens. Now, most people who think deer farming think venison. But here, the antler velvet is the driving force. The harvesting of live tissue is controversial, but it's this crop that's led to selective breeding and the huge red stags that this country is famous for. A world record stag is really just an added bonus. For the Frasers, breeding a good head is just like improving milk yield in a cow. It's science, not weird science, just good science and good husbandry. Our ability to harvest is obviously uh, something which we think about a lot because you are harvesting a tissue off a, off a mammal. So we have to be able to demonstrate really clearly that we're not uh, having any negative impact on the animal through harvesting of the velvet. So we got we spend a lot of, or well, the industry in New Zealand spends a lot of money and in investment into protecting the animal and ensuring that there's no harm or no pain or unnecessary suffering to the animal from taking the velvet off. 
And, and you, you've, you've got quite complex facilities for doing this. And it, yep. I, can, I can believe that because, I mean, the thing I've got from Ollie as a family in the, la in the last few days is that y your passion for the animal, I would, I, I'd struggle to believe that you would do anything that, uh, that's your life's work, so I can Absolutely. understand that their welfare yep. is paramount to you. Very important. Andrew offers to show Neil how the velvet is removed in their state-of-the-art deer race and crush, but let's get some hunting under our belts. We've travelled to a remote hunting lodge in the northern part of South Island. This will be our base for the next couple of days. Both Neil and Laurent Hua from Magic Safari Lodges will have the chance of a tar bull. What's the plan this evening, Neil? I think we're going looking for tar this evening, David. I just saw a couple of minutes ago and I've never seen anything like it before. I'm really quite looking forward to it. Something new to learn, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different landscape, different species. Apparently fun. they're the hardest animal to drop on the spot. Are they? Now you tell me, you should have told me that afterwards. <laughs> As we arrive in the late afternoon, our first outing is more for spotting than hunting. Marcus gets us into a group, but nothing is suitable. So we had a group of uh, mainly females for last with one just about mature bull. Um, he was a four or five year old, really nice, really good length horns. He just was be nice to get something with a little bit more age. Um, yeah, they just fed out of the trees below us here. And we got a good look at them there for yeah. a while, but it's not quite what we're after. Something with a bit, bit more age to them. I, I think for me the great thing is, you know, I've travelled half around the world and it, this is the first time I've seen tar in the flesh in my life. And uh, just to learn a little bit about how to age them, and I mean, Marcus was talking us through there. I mean, uh, we always look at deer with angle ahead and that sort of thing, but things that I'd never, I'd never thought of until I was told, you know, sort of the length of mane makes a big difference. Bull tar, they're sort of um, from age four or five, they're starting to get to like maturity as in, in their looks. Um, obviously, the older the better, but you know, we've shot tar. Does that they're... apply to men as well, by the way? <laughs> 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 I'm just hoping here. <laughs> You know answer, fucker. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, um, we've shot, I mean, we've shot tar 14, 15, but a majority of our tar we shoot a six to eight sort of thing. Uh -huh. And you'll see a lot of times when they get five onwards, they'll start to get big stripes down their back. So that's sort of a pretty good sign, like a grizzly bear, okay. that they're a mature bull. Oh, but not all the time. But they will live sort of 14 or 15 years. It was a very old one. It's yep. a very old one. Yep. So sort of typically sort of eight nines is, is big. It's, yep. It's at the top of it's going to... Yeah, the nannies will live um, quite a bit older than that. The wonderful location of the accommodation means that at first light, we can glass from the comfort of the lodge balcony. Time invested here will mean less time wasted on the hill. So this is a new one to me, David. This is the 7mm Blazer Magnum. And... Uh, Fired a couple of shots through at the target, seems to shoot pretty well. So we'll see what it can do here. the rest of the guys to spot. It's a crawl and stalk that feels a bit Scottish. This is in my mind kind of what I expected. So it's fairly rough going. But it's really interesting. The deer tracks through it. From a distance you can see nothing. Neil sets himself up. 
he attaches the Spartan bipod to lift his Blaza R8 above the grass. Neil range finds the bull at 300 metres. It's a hard shot, but one Neil is prepared for every day of the season back home in the Highlands. Yeah, there's like a yellow mark on his neck. Then do. I'm ready. The tar runs and we lose him in the thick cover. It's not ideal. What can you do? He's still got an eye on him. We think he's down, but it's going to be tense before we find out if the strike is fatal. So looking at this piece of kit, Andrew, is it? Let's return to the farm, where Andrew shows Neil around the designer deer facility. This is where the animals are de-antlered for velvet and they carry out artificial insemination. A true understanding of deer behaviour is vital for this to work and keep working. Animals come through here year after year. If it were a distressing ordeal, the deer would do anything to avoid it and managing a quarter of a tonne of muscle with spiky headgear becomes a major headache. That's a three-year-old style. The son of one of the ones we just showed you and when we're valving, it's usually two, two stags to a pen. So all these pens will have two stags with 60 days worth of antler growth on them. And then from there, they run one at a time round to the crush. So <coughs> usually usually come out of this, this pen here and everything sort of follows along behind. But all these doors, so you never have to actually get in physically with the deer if you don't want to. So the skate comes around, you pick up the skate, so you can imagine the deer's in front of you, so he's still, he's still moving. And then lastly you pick up the last, last gate, and he's just straight on the crush. What we really find now is that deer need to see each other. So if they can, if they can see their mates, you know, rather than being isolated away from the herd, because they're a natural social animal, aren't they? So, if they can see their mate somewhere, they're, they're happy. So this is why we've got all these pens um, have all open um, sight. So it is like if, as Hamish is walking down the lane here, if he was walking down the lane, the deer can actually see him coming as well. Uh -huh. So there's no real surprises, because that's the trouble in some of these yeah, dark well. low sheds. They all of a sudden, somebody's at the door. What are they, get, what are they doing? Uh -huh. But here they, they, they can sense um, their, their mates, his uh -huh. neighbours, and they can also sense you coming. Back on the hill, and it's taken Neil and Marcus a good few hours to find the tar. The shot was fatal, but as they'd warned, this beast takes some dropping. It's been a long, steep day. Indebted to Marcus for knowing his way around the place, keeping us right. Whew. They're a lot bigger than they first appear, eh? And I mean, certainly the lesson for me is that they're, they're a pretty tough creature. Very much so. They're just a ball of muscle. Uh huh. Very stout. We equate a lot to bear, grizzly bear hunting. Yeah. They're, they're, they're waddle like a bear. They're just very, very strong on the front shoulders. They're incredible climbers, both up and downhill, and. Um, on flat grounds, probably where they where they normally run the slowest or walk the slowest. It's, uh -huh. it's around a balance. And he didn't drop to, to my first shot, which I was disappointed at. It's uh, that's tar hunting. Yep. Yeah. So our lessons are learned because they were every bit as hardy as you said they were. And the pipers back with us. Both Laurent and I were very keen to see tar and to learn a bit about them and have a chance to, to hunt them. And uh, I'll certainly tuck this experience under my belt having learned a bit. Bright sunlight played a, played a part, not a thing I'm used to. And certainly uh, reading ground uh, played a part, so thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, maybe we'll have to come back to New Zealand again if Marcus and uh, our host, the Fraser family, will let us. Just a few moments ago, Hamish uh, Fraser 
who's probably a better piper than most of the guys that work for me, struck up and gave us a blast of Highland Cathedral and he's just about you. to well play another tune for us now as we drag a tar off the hill rather than a stag. Both tar and red deer are a New Zealand success story. Both taste great and are fantastic sport. One has antlers, the other has horns, and that makes a world of difference. Next time, Neil gets a chance to stalk a New Zealand red. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, the Frasers. And as you'll hear about in news in a minute, the New Zealand government has just announced plans to take out one third of the tar population in South Island. I mean, you have to wonder with 1080 what they're playing at down under. And talking of people who play at things down under, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The government has seen off a small group of MPs who tried to sneak in a ban on children using air guns. The MPs have now agreed to remove those clauses from the bill, along with clauses restricting the home loading of ammunition and a new clause which would have made it an offence to purchase or acquire shotgun ammunition without a valid firearm certificate. The battle for gun owners to prove their responsibility is not over. The government promises it's looking at what law changes surrounding air guns may be required. Thanks to Andy McGarty for sending in this story. Hunts all over the country are blowing for Bradley. They're marking the tragic death of 14-year-old Bradley John, who was found dead at his school in Clenetley. Keen hunter Bradley had been suffering attacks by bullies. Hunts are standing up against bullying at schools with the campaign. As Charlie mentioned earlier in the programme, New Zealand is planning a mass tar cull to start at the end of the month. The New Zealand Department of Conservation proposes removing a total of 17,500 tar of the estimated 35,000 tar on public land. One of the guides we met in New Zealand is currently working with Neil in Scotland. This was his reaction to the news. I don't think they realise the effect this has on the local businesses. Um, within the area that the tar are situated and um, I'm a professional guide within New Zealand and it's going to greatly affect the future of not only the hunting industry but also helicopter operators, hotel owners, motel owners, you know, everyone that is in that area with small businesses and um, I think that something needs to be done and uh, needs to be stopped. We recognise that Tar do need to be culled, but they need to be culled in a sustainable way for everyone in the future. The BBC has defended its long-running soap opera radio programme, The Archers, over allegations of illegal hunting. Animal rights activists claim The Archers is promoting illegal hunting when Shula Archer, a joint master of the fictional South Borsetshire hunt, said on last week's programme that she planned to go autumn hunting to train the young hounds. Anti say that this is a reference to cub hunting. However, the broadcaster hit back at these claims, clarifying that the references to autumn hunting were actually about legal trail hunting, which involves an artificial scent rather than fox cubs. A police armed response team was recently called out to a pigeon shooter. However, when they discovered the shooter was not a terrorist, they said he needed to produce a general license. This is, of course, incorrect. Everyone is automatically covered by the general licences for shooting pest species such as pigeons. This system was introduced by the then Tory government to cover up mistakes they made when the UK adopted the 1979 EEC Birds Directive. The National Gamekeepers Organisation made one of its most prestigious awards last weekend. Connor Baker of Reese Heath College won the Brian Jenkins Memorial Trophy at the Midland Game Fair for being the top gamekeeping student in the country. He's pictured here receiving it from NGO chairman Liam Bell. Less good news for the owner of this Springer Spaniel called Ammo, which was stolen at the Midland Game Fair. She has an all-white body with liver patch head. If you've seen her, please contact A1 Decoys. There are more international shooting medals for Great Britain. GB's target sprint squad secured three more medals at the ISSF World Championships in Changwon. The women's team event saw six GB athletes walk away with a medal round their necks and two teams of three winning silver and bronze. On the same day in what was probably the most exciting race of the championships, Oliver Vass and Rachel McManus won bronze in mixed pairs. Thanks to James Baxter for the pictures. The next target sprint event is the Welsh Championship on Saturday the 22nd of September. 
as Hurricane Florence hammered North Carolina, the local duck shooting community came out to help. Called the Cajun Navy, shooters in motorboats set off into the flooded country to rescue people stranded by the storm. They're pictured here assembling in Wilmington, North Carolina. And finally, it's a new meaning for the phrase pre-check flights. This video of a bear crawling over a light aeroplane in Alaska was recently on the Fly 8 MA channel on YouTube. You are now to date with Phil Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Now, why, you ask yourself, are you watching an elderly gentleman like me dressed up like an advertising hoarding? Well, the answer is we've teamed up with the gin company, Hadrian's Wall Gin, and we're offering you viewers with UK addresses only, I'm afraid, the chance to win a case of six bottles of Hadrian's Wall Gin and an exclusive discount on buying the stuff. Hadrian's Wall Gin is an excellent small batch gin from Northumberland with Roman botanicals, so you're lucky I'm not reading this in Latin. Do you need gin this season? Well, do us a favour, please, and pop over to bit.ly slash gin offer, where you can follow the instructions and put FSTV01 into the code box of the checkout, and that will give you free delivery for your gin anywhere in the UK. What a magnificent and exclusive offer that is. Even easier, do you want to win gin? Simply put Hadrian's Wall Gin into the comments below this film on YouTube or on Facebook and we'll draw a winner in a few weeks' time. Now, someone else who will be cooling off or warming up the slow gin, depending on how you like it, Paul Childerly is going to be starting shooting in a few weeks' time. And for Modern Gamekeeper this week, he's taking delivery of partridges. <laughs> It's early September and Paul has almost completed his morning gamekeeping duties. Added to his normal routine is the arrival of more partridges. Good bird. The partridge pens are very different to the structure of the pheasant pens. For a start, they're covered and for good reason. Different setup. You have different sized pens depending on what numbers you're, you're releasing. We do 30 by 30s. Partridges are not like pheasants. They'll basically be gone straight away. So if you just release these straight into the into a pen, clip, yeah, and we can't clip partridges, so we'll be gone. And what you want to do with these is put them in an area, like a game cover area where you want them to live. Hold them in there for a couple of days, get them established. They realise that's home. And then you release. Say you put 100 in a pen, you release 25 after a couple of days. And then release another 25, then 25, and 25. So within like five days, they're all out. So Nigel, just, just a few of the rough differences between rearing pheasants and partridges. The main difference really is um, with the partridge, you're keeping it till us 14, 12 to 14 weeks older, whereas your pheasant is normally seven and a half weeks. Yeah. This year, with the hot weather, we think the partridges have been much easier. Yeah, yeah. The hot weather seems to have suited them better, really. Yeah. On the whole, I would say, from a game farm point of view, the partridge is easier to rear. The main drawback, probably in the rear of a partridge, is if they do have any disease pressures, mortality can be higher oh, much yeah. quicker. Yeah. You know, yeah. when it comes. Losses are there straight yeah, away, yeah. Yeah, you, get, yeah. you don't tend to get any um, sort of leeway with a partridge you can sort of pick up large numbers quickly whereas a pheasant may take a day or two longer and give you a little bit more time to sort it out get it back on its feet again yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. what about you, you say obviously you hold these you know these are 15 weeks so you know and they shovel shovel in the food down yeah yeah so you've got I mean, the cost yeah the cost they, effective, are, they right? are much more expensive they're, they're cheaper in the early stage but once you get them sort of over 12 weeks then they're really consuming probably between eight to ten p of food a week really really yeah um, yeah but you know i think the extra cost you maybe pay for them 
well, what you have to pay for them, you get back with the fact that they're much stronger and, yeah. you know, they yeah. do take, you know, a better release, really. Yeah, and, and with the releasing side of things, you know, you know it's worked well with, with us this year because we, we talked about, you know, what ration they're on yeah, that, yeah. and so they come and, and yeah i you, think that is the, the other difference with partridges they are a little bit more finicky than the pheasant whereas a change of diet and a change of pellet size yeah um can sometimes upset yeah and even hopper color yeah, size yeah, yeah. And, yeah all those things i think if if people want to be really um do the job properly it is important to liaison with the game farmer and try and match everything yeah so that everything's a nice transition rather than you know changes from you know there's a change when they come to a different exactly, site yeah, a change yeah. when they go out into pens so if you can just keep the food rations the same the drinkers the feeders the same it just yeah. makes it all much more easier for them really. yeah yeah no it's worked touch wood yeah it's worked well this year for me yeah. so i'm a no. i'm a happy smiley boy for the job the job's a hard job from both sides yeah so, you know i don't yeah. think it pays to complicate it if there's no no, no definitely real yeah reason yeah with the partridges in place he can continue his feeding routine for this he's using a spinner on the back of the quad also on the quad is the shotgun at this time of year, it's vital to have it within reach. Yeah, basically, you have a, uh, either a shotgun or a rifle with you all the time. Um, you turn up at the pen in the evening, you, could have, you know, it's a, it's a woodland, so foxes do move in the afternoons. Um, you come to a pen, you'll have a fox either working the outside or actually in the pen. Then you've got other things, stoked weasels, whatever else. Yeah, so, so it's good because when you don't have it, you can guarantee you'll be, uh, you need it. This is a, a Remington pump action, eight shot extendable tube. Pump action, you don't see pump action. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got a uh, a semi-auto um, but I've actually got this for my other business with the with the, the corporate entertaining and the and the uh, the trigger time uh, training. Um, but also it's I don't know a bit of fun as well isn't it? It's quite practical even though you don't see them very often it's actually quite a practical, quite a safe gun because you can, you know, obviously have it open. Um, you can have it shut, load it from the bottom. You can know there's nothing in there. It stays shut. So actually, for a practical gun, and obviously if you're if you're in in uh, in action, you can keep banging until fox or whatever else is uh, no more. Yes, yeah, work tool. A young carrion crow had some chicken uh, manure parked here just through these fields and uh, it's brought in about 20 carrions right next to the farm and uh, they're all youngsters and they're pain because what they do they've got uh, the the, far, the feed store just there and what is it, early mornings late evenings no one's about there they go in and hammer the bag so normally i wouldn't really bother with crows this time of year unless they're a problem on the feeders and stuff this is a youngster Come back to action. Yep. Hop up. With the feeding done, it's dogging in. There are plenty of techniques, but Duke has played before. Paul is ultra careful to have Duke in view before yeah. setting off. Next time, we'll be up at first light to see just what needs to be done to keep this lot safe and well. Thank you, Paul, who's been dealing with all kinds of problems this week. He's got forestry work going on next to the pens. He's got drive-bys with kids shooting his pheasants with catapults. Really, gamekeeping is not for the faint-hearted. Now, from Bedfordshire to the wider world of hunting and shooting, on YouTube it is Hunting YouTube.
This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Jonas Tillmans from the Out of Perth channel in Germany sends me his new video, which comes with English subtitles. He is out after Roebuck in July. Meanwhile, Kjell Hvam from Norway has put up a film showing highlights from his Roebuck season. You've heard of the director's cut? Well, this is the beater's cut. Shotaway Films' partridge shooting video shows what goes into producing good quality partridge on a shoot day. Alexis Chass has put up a compilation of shots at Corvid's in France during 2018. He shoots them over decoys, plus he has a caller. Hakan Hankioglu leaves his native Cyprus to go after wood pigeons in Macedonia, plus wild boar and duck. Robin Foxer and shooting mate Ian are shooting rabbits in the UK on a golf course and a horse paddock permission. Robin also runs through his setup. In Australia, Apex Fox Whistles shows a fox whistled in from 500 metres away. Amazing. There are some pickers up who do well to watch this film. And finally, here is an alligator hunt from Florida, including how to cook the animal afterwards. In the words of the bloke on the channel, Gourmet. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you by email about this show. Field Sports Britain at 7 pm. UK time every Wednesday, whatever the weather, even Hurricane Florence blowing through the West Country behind me. Don't forget to enter the Hadrian's Wall Gin competition. Don't forget to go to bit.ly slash gin offer for your Hadrian's Wall Gin discount. And of course, you can become a Field Sports Channel angel or dragon. You can join the Field Sports Channel nation. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out more about that. It only remains for me to say good hunting, good shooting, good fishing. Goodbye.